This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and flow chart with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf, and Joe Fit. Hey. What's up, everyone? You have that slow what's up going on today. Ooh, I got, I'm, I'm feeling slow today. Are you? No, not at all, oh, actually. Man. I'm, I'm feeling pretty fired up after the, the, yeah. the couple interviews we did today. So today, yeah, dude, I'm like super jacked up after this interview. Well, this one, I, I, I flat out said right in the beginning um, that I'm a, I'm a fanboy and I mm-hmm. was really excited to do this interview because this is somebody who I legitimately do listen to a lot of their podcasts and I have read multiple of his books and I've... Um, he's been in my ear a lot, both in audiobook format and podcast format. So, um, this was, this was one that I was super excited to talk about. Cue the fanboy alarm. I wish I had sound effects. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't think we need a fanboy alarm. Oh yes. It's obvious. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, uh, I won't dance around it anymore. James Altucher is obviously on this podcast because you probably saw the title of the episode. (laughs) So we're talking about James Altucher. Isn't it funny how we always try to like kind of sneakily hide who we're talking about until like two minutes into the intro, but they know exactly what we're getting into. I I don't know why we do that. It's just, we're being dramatic because we're thinking that we're going to be dramatic, but we're really not. It's because we feel like we need to say something in an intro when really like we could probably just jump straight into the content and people would be just as happy. That's a good point. Sorry, we are not trying to waste your time. (laughs) But biggest takeaways, money, man. So he's going to lay out this very practical like thought exercise that you can do right along with us because Mm -hmm. he points it right back at us, which is super cool. And I, I I felt, and you'll hear it in the pocket, it's a sense of freedom understanding what is actually required of you to create the wealth that you want in your life, whatever wealth uh, definition is for you, mm-hmm. you know? money, giving back, whatever. But he lines out very systematically uh, in the most conservative ways possible, too, uh, with how to keep that money going. So that was my biggest takeaway. I loved it. Yeah, no, it was a great discussion. We talked about, I mean, we got a a real big overview of his entire story arc and, you know, how he started at HBO and sort of progressed through things like angel investing and um, got involved in podcasting and writing. And we get that whole story arc, which I was really fascinated by because I I haven't heard all the intricacies of it. We actually talked about angel investing and how to pick the right investments and how he did, like his philosophy and what he decides Mm -hmm. to invest in. Um, We talked about like uh, money and how much money you actually need and how how to how to invest that money to live off of it uh, fairly easily and passively and how to kind of get everything you want in life. Um, James called me out, man. Yeah, he called you amateur hour, <laughs> which is cool. I agree. It was Matt. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was great, and um, we took notes on this one, like always. So rush over, be quick uh, to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp, C-O-M-P. We take them notes for you. Very detailed action guide, and especially after this one, I'm expecting these notes to be a nice formulaic process of here's how you can create that wealth for yourself. And in this bolded form, you're probably going to be like, oh, wow, that that's a lot simpler. I'm not going to say easy. It's a lot more of a straight line approach mm-hmm. where I think you'll get the feeling that it's it doesn't involve a lot more than probably what you already have. Mm-hmm. Your specialized knowledge and personality and connections. Yeah. So hustleandflowchart.com slash notes. Uh, we took all those notes for you. You can get them there for free if you're quick. Those notes do go away if you don't get them within the first week or so of this episode coming out. Also, egpletter.com. We've hammered it to death. You've heard of it. You know about it. That's how you can support the show. Go sign up for the egp letter at egpletter.com it's not just a letter it's a membership community we Mm -hmm. do live training calls uh we we do we add extra training as we experiment with new traffic sources and new marketing strategies and we share what's working with you in there and of course you do get the printed newsletter mailed directly to your door every single month and a cool community in there too and a great community which and everybody raves about the newsletter so you're going to want that and it also supports the show and keeps it alive and pays the bills of keeping this podcast going. So uh, that's over at egpletter.com. Now let's go chat with James Altucher. Hey, James, welcome to the show. Matt and Joe, thanks for having me on the show. I'm really I'm really grateful you asked me. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, Garen, shout out to Garen because I know he's checking it out. So I appreciate the connection there. 
And um, yeah, I don't know. It's just so many fascinating topics that you bring to the table with your podcast and newsletters and books and da, da, da. <laughs> so yeah. many things. I mean, quite honestly, you're someone that we've, we've, we've wanted to chat with for a while. I've read Choose Yourself. I've read Choose Yourself Guide to Wealth. I, I personally listen to your podcast a lot. So I'm mm-hmm. um, really excited to chat with you. You're, you're, you're sort of one of my uh, online celebrity uh, guys that I'm a, a bit of a fanboy of. So I'm looking Ooh, forward to chatting. Crushing out. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, uh, I've got to, I've got to reread those books. They're pretty good, but I, I sometimes forget them myself. <laughs> yeah, pretty, probably pretty ingrained in there by now. But yeah, uh, you've got you've got like a a, a pretty um, eclectic backstory. You you worked at HBO. You've done uh, you worked for uh, I believe the New York Times. You were you did stuff in venture capitalists. You founded startups. You've had multiple bestsellers. Uh, you've gotten rid of everything you owned and got rid of the place where you lived. So uh, a lot of a lot of story and a lot of talking points that we could go down. But do you think you could give us a real quick sort of story arc of, of how you kind of got into being an entrepreneur and, and your sort of story arc to now? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to do it quick because everything is there's so many ups and downs. But I was um, I really I really wanted to either write a novel or make a TV show. So I was working at HBO, but I happened to have had a technical background and I knew about this thing that nobody else knew about then called the internet and the World Wide Web, Triple W. <laughs> and nobody was doing anything with this at the time. This is like 1994. It was just beginning to make kind of the mainstream media, even though it had been around a few years at that point, but it was kind of coming out of more academia. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, uh, nobody knew anything about it. So uh, I I remember I was really obsessed with doing a TV show. That's all I wanted to do. But I uh, my, my, my brother-in-law was in a, the CD-ROM business. He was making CD-ROMs, which is an industry that doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. And he was kind of going out of business because this industry doesn't exist anymore. So I'm like, oh, how about I show you this thing uh, called the web? And... Uh, I showed him how to make a website and how to, and he was, he's a designer. So he was, he was like, Oh, this is neat. And he learned how to design on a website, but I still know all the software stuff. Now you don't really need to know software to make a pretty good website. Cause you could use things like WordPress and all that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, uh, you know, then a friend of a friend of a friend needed a website done. So he and I together made a website. I was dead broke. I was working at HBO. My salary was, nothing for new york city i had like a roommate and uh in one room and we made this website and i got seventeen thousand dollars i was like Hmm. rich like literally like in my mind i was like the richest person in the world sure and so i moved to an apartment that i liked and i just i remember i gave the guy, the, the landlord, he was the he was the owner of the Chelsea Hotel on 23rd Street in New York City. Mm. I gave I gave him this bag of cash, seventeen thousand dollars cash, <laughs> ninety four, ninety five, and I said, I just I want to, what can I live in for a year with this? And he like looks at the cash and he's like, Are you a drug dealer? <laughs> and I said, No, I work at HBO. And he said, Well, can we get free cable? And I said, sure, <laughs> whatever. And uh, uh, so he put me in a room and I started living there and I lived there for, for quite some time afterwards. And, and then it was just, I realized, oh, okay, this was kind of neat that money, money bought me things. And mm-hmm. so I, I really hated doing the work, but <laughs> during the day I worked at my job and then at night I worked with my brother-in-law and more and more people were starting to build websites. They heard about this web thing. So we built AmericanExpress.com. We built, uh, and then we started building all these websites for entertainment companies, and mm-hmm. uh, in particular, uh, built like every rap record label website. So like Loud Records, Bad Boy Records, Death Row, Interscope, all these websites, Jive Records, wow. uh, stuff for Sony, BMG, and then we started doing all these movie websites. We did Miramax.com, uh, New Line, Fine Line, October Films, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, timewarner.com and hbo.com actually because i was still working at hbo and so i essentially kind of hired myself to do hbo.com <laughs> and then i was in business and so built that business sold it made a lot of money lost everything wanted to figure out how i could 
you know, I thought like I had won the lottery. I was really depressed. I had lost. I had cashed out. I was smart enough to have cashed out, but then I made all these bad investments mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, huh, I don't know anything. I thought I was smart, but I don't know anything about investing. And I, I had just won the lottery because I benefited from this internet boom. And now what am I going to do? I'm basically stuck. So I, you know, I lost my house. I, I moved 60 miles north and like the small, I, I'm probably the only person who, to, who, who downsized by moving out of New York. You know, it, usually you upsize when you move out of New York City. I so I went from a 5,000 square foot place to a 1,500 square foot place in like the middle of a blizzard and with my two kids and I had no money and no income and I had to figure out how to day trade to make some money. So I wrote some software to help me day trade. I, I was I had a technical background. So I wrote software to model the stock markets. And then I figured, oh, you know, it's working and I'm going to raise some money. So I started, a, I, I go on and on. Yeah. This story goes on and on. But I basically started several businesses, lost everything every time. I had to get, there's like three skills, making it, keeping it, growing it. And I was making it, but I couldn't keep it or grow it. And, or I couldn't keep it long enough to grow it. And it took me a long time. And I was, I was really, I kept making it, losing it, making it, losing it, mm -hmm. or I would make it. And then, uh, the IRS would take a big chunk mm -hmm. or I would, it, and then the financial crisis would happen or I would make it. And then I would invest it, but I was still learning, you know, some investments don't pay off for, for years. I was just doing a lot of angel investing mm -hmm. and some investments were great, but they, you know, I'd be right on the brink of going broke again before an investment would pay off. And so I was always scared, always depressed, always anxious. Uh, and it was just, just a horrible, just, it's just a horrible thing when you're like desperate for, for money, just to, just to live. And right. I never had, but I, but once you get that entrepreneurship bug, you don't want to work for anyone again. Like one time I did take a job and with like a private equity firm and I just remember being in the middle of a meeting and um, I was so bored. It was a meeting I had set up, like maybe we should invest in Brazil. Brazil's hot. And so I invited all these Brazilian investors and I'm in the middle of this meeting and I was just like so bored and I was feeling sick and uh, I, I left. I left my jacket on the chair. Like I was wearing a suit. I left my jacket on the chair and I said, I got to go to the bathroom. I walked out and I just went to the elevator and it was the, it was the Trump building on, on wall street. We were on like the 45th floor, whatever. I went all the way down, walked to the subway, took the subway to the train station, took the train 60 miles North to where I lived. And I never went back again and wow. never spoke to them again either. Wow. And that, that was like the one I was just like my second or third day at, at, at this particular <laughs> job. And I just said, I don't know what's going to happen. I just hope one of my investments comes through and, uh, you know, one of them did a little bit, but, uh, and then I started just writing and focusing on that. Did was, you ever, did you ever see anybody walk around with your jacket in New York city? No, but I had one of those generic <laughs> blue jackets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just wondering if it was too special. Was, was there ever like a, a, a turning point or like an aha moment for you? You mentioned that like you had to, you struggled to like keep and actually grow the money. Was there ever like any sort of aha moment or turning point for you where it, it kind of clicked and you started to figure out how to keep more and more of it? Yes. Uh, the, the turning, there was like a couple of turning points. It doesn't happen like all at once, but, but there was two types of turning points. Um, but I'll, I'll focus on the one about keeping money, mm -hmm. which is, I, it's a mantra. I, I say every single day, which is, I am the stupidest person in the world. <laughs> so wow. I just have to remind myself of that over and over again. And then I'll be able to keep money. Whenever I think I'm intelligent and I, oh, I could make a decision on my own. This company looks good. I'll, I'll be the only investor and I'll take a third of the company and I'll help them using my genius. And, <laughs> and this is going to be the next Google. Those investments, 100% of the time, and I'm not kidding, 100% of the time fail. I have never had an investment that I discovered win. Yeah. Uh, so, so the flip side of that is somebody who's, if someone who's a billionaire, great investor, uh, calls me up or somehow I figures out is like in an investment that, that 
at the same level I can get in, then I say, oh, I'll invest alongside this guy and I'll never have to think about it again because it's his job to think about it. Hmm. Those investments almost 100% of the time work out. <laughs> so, I, I so that, just, just deciding that is my angel investing philosophy. And I'm talking about angel investments. Hmm. The, actually, the same thing applies to stock market investments, but this is just, I've made most uh, money on angel investments. So that specific philosophy uh, has stopped me from losing money and has, uh, you know, people say, oh, invest, if you're an angel investor, you're only going to have one out of 10 investments work out. Nope. Uh, if I invest alongside great investors, then 100% of them have been working out. Mm. Yeah, it's always in what I've heard in, in that space for, and this probably goes any space is it, you're investing in the people and the partnerships, not always the idea. Do you find that to be pretty much the truth behind it? 100%. And so I used to have more rules. It's like my only rule now really is, are there people going into this investment with me who are smarter mm -hmm. and more successful? If yes, invest. If no, then don't invest. <laughs> and uh, But I used to have more rules. I used to have a rule, which I kind of still do, but you'll see what I mean in a second. Um, I used to have a rule, the CEO has to have bought Oh, sorry. The CEO has to have built and sold a business before. And the sold part is very interesting. People don't realize that because selling a business is just as hard or even more difficult than starting a business. Hmm. Like I'm in many, I've been in many good businesses where the business was good and just keeps growing and growing. But if the CEO doesn't know how to monetize the business into cash, then what's the point of the investment? The investment's no good. Right. So, and you know, also the way the CEO presents himself, presents the company, creates the perception around the company. You know, again, like you said, it's about investing in people. So when the CEO sells the business, some other company is making a very big investment in that person, the CEO. So the CEO has to be the type of person that other billionaires because you want to sell for a big amount. Mm -hmm. The CEO has to be the type of person some billionaire wants to be friends with. And so so it used to be it used to be a rule for me, oh, they have to know how to sell a company. They have to have that they have to have done it before. Mm -hmm. But I realized that if I just follow the first rule, that kind of covers the second rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cuz the billion I'm letting the billionaire or the smarter person figure that out about the CEO. I don't have to figure it out. Sure. The, the sure. less work I have to do the better it is for the company. And for the <laughs> well, especially with the mantra, I am the stupidest person in the world. <laughs> like it's going to kind of force you to partner up, you know, and find oh, the best but, people. And, and, you know, as soon as let's say a company CEO calls me up and says, let's say I'm invested and the company calls me up and says, James, um, I need your help with something. It's like, I could almost just hang up again then and never talk to them again because that investment was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so they that need my sense. help. And you know, here's the thing. I say that kind of almost in this self-deprecating way, but the reality is I have had uh, one investment where uh, I, I was on the board and I was actually critical for, I, the CEO had never sold a company before. And I, I actually realized before everybody else on the board did that he was on a almost like uh, unstoppable uh path to crashing this mm. company the ground. And I just, re I realized, you know, I looked at his cash flow. I realized how long it would take even in a best case scenario for him to raise money. And it looked to me like he was going to be out of business within about eight months. And so he denied it. The other members of the board didn't seem to really realize it. And I kind of just rally, I, I had to put a lot of work into this. I had to rally everybody to agree with me. We forced the CEO's hand eight months to the day after that moment, he was not going to make payroll the next day as I had predicted. Mm -hmm. And that like at midnight that night, he, he sold the company. And wow. so, and he, and he made, he made about 12 million on it and he was kind of kicking and screaming every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Very good guy. Just did not want to sell the company. Didn't really real. He had not done this before. He didn't realize how close he was to death the, the night before yep. he realized and was, you know, we were busy trying to get all the board members to agree at that point. But uh, that was one time where I was able to help out. And I realize now I have enough 
business experience that I can actually provide help. And in some cases I do, but, um, so yeah. it's a little too flippant for me to say I, 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 I shouldn't help. Uh, but best case scenario is I, I don't have to help. <laughs> yeah. It's just a safer bet all along. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Go ahead, Matt. So are you, are you having like people come to you all the time and, and, and pitching you on new businesses or are you kind of like keeping your finger on the pulse on like angel list or how, how are the, how, how does the deal flow work for you? So, uh, yes, people constantly pitch me businesses, but I don't really respond to any of those because if they are coming to me, then it's already no good. Mm -hmm. Uh, like it's, again, I, I'm like, I, I more try to keep connected with friends who have really good deal flow with other people smarter than us, or maybe my friends are smarter than me. And then I say, okay, uh, if you're investing, just count me in. I don't even need to think about it. And the other rule I have is um, no more than you know one percent of my portfolio per investment. So this way, if it mm. does hypothetically go to zero, oh, okay, I lost one percent. Um, but I also try to go because you know these billionaires are investing. They're not investing in things that are oh, I hope I make thirty percent on this. They're they're investing in things where they hope they can make a thousand percent or more. Right. So. Uh, uh, this way, if I lose, I only lose one percent. But if I win, I can make ten, twenty, thirty percent or more in a in a really good situation. So, in general, putting a together a diversified portfolio like that is good. Now, you mentioned angel list. That's a way to kind of systematize. I haven't done this, but it is a way to systematize the style of investing. As you find investors who successful investors who have syndicates, what's called syndicates on angel list, and then you get to see all of their. You join the syndicate. You get to see all of their de the deals they're investing in, and then you could decide if you're going to piggyback their investments and you pay them a percentage of the profits, which is more than fair. Mm -hmm. And so that is a way, if I didn't have the current deal flow that I have, I could get just as good deal flow by doing that approach. I, I do believe that approach works. Got it. Cool. Now, I want to go back really fast because it, it sounded like, and I, I think you said it a little quick there, um, so you built up all these amazing websites for huge brands, and it sounded like you cashed them out and then did a lot of investing. Is, was that what it was right after yeah. that point? Right. So I made, I, I, I sold that business for stock. The stock went from two to 48. I cashed wow. out with about like $15 million worth, and, um, and so it was cash. I couldn't believe it. I was like, pretty much like reloading my prudential stock market account like over and over i have this much cash like oh my gosh i i did it i never have to literally i could turn my brain off and never have to think again <laughs> yeah everything i've done up until this point was thinking so i can get money yeah. and now i just turn it off and do nothing and uh and then i just was like oh no but maybe i'm I, I don't know. I felt like this sense of scarcity, like, oh, I only made what? Like this guy down my next door neighbor made a hundred million. He's not smarter than me. I should a hundred million. <laughs> and so I started thinking, I'm really, I'm going to invest in all these companies. And I was just investing in like the dumbest companies on the planet. And I lost, it, people were like, oh, what did you do to lose all that money? And I think they think I'm going to say like hookers and drugs. But <laughs> if I was doing hookers and drugs, my guess is it wouldn't be $15 million worth. Like it seems like that's a lot of hookers. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a lot of hookers and drugs. <laughs> I mean, unless like a hooker was like, I don't know, are there hookers out there who are like a million dollars? There's a market for everybody. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I remember being in college smoking pie. It didn't really seem to cost a million dollars for a joint. <laughs> but um, uh, although I hear marijuana has gotten stronger since I was in college. But, <laughs> Times have changed. Yeah. But, really just bad investing and and then also you know i like bought, i had to buy the biggest apartment in new york city and then completely uh build it from scratch it was like a, a uh they made sails for sailboats it was a it was a factory and i had to re redo the whole uh floor from scratch and that cost a lot of money so it was just doing making just lots of a series of really stupid decisions in a row yeah and, and like i used to um go to Atlantic city a lot. So people are like, Oh, you're a gambling. No, I would play poker and like any game I would study it and try to get good. And then I got, I got pretty good. And actually I should have just stuck to playing poker instead of trying to be a fancy investor. Like then I would have done really well. <laughs> Probably uh, so. It's a mental game. Keeps you stimulated that way. You could have been yeah, the I next love, Dan Bilzerian. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, and I love games. And this was like a few years before, or it was kind of a couple of years before the poker TV thing happened. And so I would have been on the front lines of that mm -hmm. whole uh, move up. And uh, that would have been great for me. And instead, I, somebody told me, uh, you're, you're so smart. Uh, and you know all about this internet stuff. What are you doing just playing like a card game all the time? Because I was I played like from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. every single night without a break, like wow. seven days a week, 365 days a year. And after this guy said this to me, I was like, huh, he thinks I'm stupid for doing this. I better do what everybody thinks is smart. And so, again, it's like all these things where I needed validation. I needed more money, which was ridiculous. Yeah. I needed people to, to think I was smart and, do, and doing the right thing. So I just, instead of doing what I wanted, I started doing things I didn't want and things that I wasn't good at. And uh, at least I wasn't good at it then and just lost everything. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I just, every time I would make money, I just wasn't, it, it just, uh, I, I got in the money business, which is very difficult, a very difficult industry. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about investing. I learned a lot in a, in a lot of different ways, but it was just not what I really enjoyed. And it was just a very unpleasant, I want to say, 13 years that ensued from there. Mm. Well, I'm curious of how you got past that scarcity mindset, the outside influence, the feeling like you needed more, even though you had more than, you know, most of the planet's ever going to ever have. Uh, what, how does that thinking pattern look differently now, uh, compared to back well, then? Well, let's say, I, you know, I think it's a hundred, it's impossible to a hundred percent get rid of that. Mm. Um, and you know, some of that is rational. Like, I have kids to raise and, you know, family and there's some things I like in life and some things, you know, I don't. And so you need a little bit of money, but I think in, in general, just understanding when enough is enough. Like, uh, you know, you start, you, you start to analyze, well, okay, if I had a billion dollars, for instance, what would I do with the money? And you look at, you look around, what do most billionaires do with the money? Well, they do. Well, let me ask you guys this. When you think of all the billionaires you know of, what do they what do they tend to do with the money? Like list like five things, four things. So you see a lot of trips. Uh, there might be some private planes involved, cars, um, fancy food experiences. It's kind of up leveling uh, the the typical oh. overhead. You know, bigger house. Oh, 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 let me just stop you because maybe I asked the wrong question. Mm. I feel like that was like an amateur hour answer. <laughs> like, like fancy food. Like if you have like. If you're a thousandaire, you can have fancy food. Yeah. Like, okay, if you want to upgrade from McDonald's, just you don't need that. You don't need to <laughs> go to Sizzler. Yeah. No, I, right, I, I think I think I get what you were asking. You know, you, you see guys like like Bill Gates going and, and trying to, you know, eradicate diseases. Um, you see, uh, and you know, the, the top two things that come to mind is they're they're dumping money into other cus um, companies, and they're. Um, they're, they're going in uh, doing philanthropy with it and, and, and trying to, to give back with it. Right. So, so, and, and by the way, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry I insulted about the amateur hours. That was I thought it was like fancy <laughs> food. Like I could, I could just, you know, any, you know, you could go right now to the best restaurant in your city and have like a great meal. So it's not, it's not like a, yeah, yeah. it's not <laughs> now if you want Wolfgang Puck to go to your house and cook for you, that's a billionaire thing. But, uh, but anyway, but yes, they like take like, you know, Bill Gates, Richard Branson, uh, Mark Cuban, uh, all these people, they, they buy, uh, their own jets. Okay. So that's like a $150 million investment. They buy a, maybe like Steve Ballmer, Mark Cuban, all these guys, Ted Leonsis, actually many people who have been on my podcast. And I think about it, they buy a sports team mm -hmm. like Steve Ballmer bought the Clippers, the worst basketball team in the world. I don't know. For, Jesse Etzler owns the Hawks and that's kind of up there too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Sarah, Sarah Blakely, Jesse Etzler, the Hawks, Steve Bomber, the Clippers. And I'm not faulting them by the way, they're basketball fans. So do what you enjoy. Uh, Mark Cuban who started broadcast.com cause he wanted to listen to basketball games over the internet. He bought the Mavericks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably, he bought it for 2 billion. It's probably worth four or 5 billion right now. It was a great investment for him. Um, you know, all these guys have, private jets, that's a $150 million investment. Uh, or they might buy, you know, like Ken Griffin, a hedge fund manager, just bought a $233 million apartment in New York City. Mm. Uh, or Bill Gates, 
He's putting tens of billions of dollars into philanthropy. Now, I'm not saying I, I wouldn't want to do that. I'm just saying, all right, I can impact the world in other ways. Uh, I don't need to spend the next 20 years trying and maybe make a billion and then give all of it anyway away to society. Bill Gates has done a pretty good job. It's easier for him to make another 10 billion and then put that to charity than to me, than for me to make 10 billion and put that to charity. So I'll let Bill Gates, he's doing a good job at it anyway. <laughs> and he's eradicated malaria in Africa, for instance, or he's on his way towards doing that. And he'll, he'll probably do many other great things. Mm -hmm. And he's other billionaires to, to do the same. So all these things that billionaires do, I don't want to do. I don't want to, I'm not interested in sports. I don't want to own a sports team. I don't like business, so I don't want to buy another big business. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to own a 747 jet and, and for $150 million. I don't want to own a $200 million apartment. I don't want to buy a $150 million painting. So I'm just trying to think of all the things that billionaires do with their money or, or like people with more than $100 million or even more than $50 million. You have to sort of say like, okay, there's nothing in my life. You, you get to the lifestyle where you say, there's absolutely nothing in my lifestyle that I would change even if I had more money. Hmm. So then what do you end up doing with that money? You're just going to either give it away or you're going to give it to your kids, which is fine. You give it to your kids though. And that's another way. Your kids are just an intermediary between your money and Wall Street because what are your kids going to do with it? They're just going to hand it over to hedge fund managers and mutual fund managers who are going to take these enormous, we're going to make millions of dollars on the fees. Hmm. And yeah, your kids will benefit, but hopefully my kids are happy in lives and and you know get good jobs that they're excited about and make their own money and you know and, and whatever money i have left over the day i die 50 years from now when they're already potentially senior citizens uh you know they'll, they'll get anyway but uh you know by then i hope they would have figured out their lives so i don't have to think so much about that yeah. uh particularly after i finish paying for their college and stuff. So like, like for instance, let me ask you guys, if you had a billion dollars, how would you amp up your lifestyle? I know I would, I would definitely, uh, I would probably stay exactly where I'm at and just kind of upgrade a little bit of what's around me, but definitely it's, it's, it's security and, and also giving back in a larger way. There's a lot of projects I would love to do myself. Like what? Uh, that, um, so I was big into the foster care. So I had seven foster kids with us, and I feel like there's a big need for that with aging out foster kids to mentor. So that yeah, I I agree with you. So right. So but you don't need don't money. Need that money. That. Yeah, <laughs> that will be a, 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 like I. So so the lifestyle. So everybody has parts of their lifestyle that they would amp up if they have freedom. So with you with freedom, you would spend more time mentoring foster kids, maybe take in more foster kids, maybe in, write or, or demonstrate to other parents that, hey, this could be a good thing for you and your mm -hmm. family and your kids. So, but that does not require money. That just requires you to have freedom and feel secure with what's in your bank and, and right. I put all these seven kids through college and, and that sort of thing. Um, but none of that requires money. What, what would you do that required more money? Let, let's say you had you know the amount to maintain your current lifestyle for life without having to to make any more money. What else would you do to amp up your life? Would you get a bigger house, for instance? I would add on to my current house for yeah. sure. I love I was, where I'm at. It's I was probably... going to say the same thing. I don't think I'd move. I'd probably just build onto the house that I have and and travel more, which I you know I know that doesn't require billionaire status to do. <laughs> yeah, I think, no, yeah. But let's let's actually take it to an extreme. Hmm. So 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 building onto your house. Um, so I I don't know how much money you would need to require your to, to keep your current lifestyle going. Mm -hmm. But let's say you, I'm going to just make up numbers, okay? Sure. Let's say right now you live on $100,000 a year after taxes. I'm just making this up. Mm -hmm. So let's just say you put all your money in municipal bonds and so you're making about 4% um, tax-free. So so you would need like, to maintain your, your current lifestyle, you would need just $2.5 million cash in the bank. Right. 4% is a hundred thousand a year. And let's say you need a little bit more because of you know uh, uh, inflation, and uh, and this assumes you'll make zero money from now on, which is also a very conservative assumption because you're creative people. You'll yeah. do things. You'll make money. You'll, whatever. And uh, 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 so that's two hundred million dollars. Now let's say you want to expand out your house. You, I'm going to just go crazy. 
we're going to just build everything like an indoor basketball court, whatever. Uh, you'll need another two million dollars, roughly, um, give or take. But okay, now you need another, now you need four and a half million dollars if you can do that house thing. And now you want to um, travel a lot. So if you want to travel internationally, you'll just go first class everywhere. If you want to travel domestically, maybe you say, hey, every now and then I'm gonna I'm gonna do uh, private. So let's say uh, you need instead of a hundred thousand a year, you need two hundred thousand a year because mm -hmm. private costs the money. So now instead of Four and a half million, you need another two and a half. So we just kind of came to a number for you of seven million. Mm -hmm. And that will that will maintain your lifestyle and allow you to build onto your home and allow you to fly private jets domestically whenever you want. And that's seven million. It's not a billion. That's right. seven million. <laughs> and, uh, everything else, unless you want to do one of these billionaire like things, ev everything else doesn't require uh, any, any other money. And yeah. even if you do all these billionaire things, what they're just doing is giving money away. Like, so they're, <laughs> they're not even spending it on themselves. They're just, they're just do, like, they're buying a basketball team so they could, cause they love basketball they're, or they're buying a jet so they can fly private even better than you. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but most of what they're going to do is just let their descendants inherit most of this money, like 99% of their money. They're just going to like, let their descendants, their children and grandchildren and whatever inherit it. And eventually the money will be gone. Their great grandchildren will lose it. So, uh, so it's useless to kind of, so, so, so 7 million, you don't even need seven because you should kind of run that money down yeah. as you get old. Like yeah. why do your kids need $7 million? Like they should work a little bit. And I'm, not <laughs> I'm like, if you have set, like, don't like, if you have set, Five million when you die, just give it to your kids. Like you don't have to like make them suffer, but you also don't have to like hold on. You didn't make all of your money just so that when you die, you can give it to your kids. Right. You make all your money to kind of spend a little, so it's okay to spend down. So maybe instead of seven, your actual number is five because you'll dip into your money a little bit, and even as you get older, maybe you'll buy private less, and you only have to do that. You know, you, the value of your house is going to go up anyway, so so you'll be able to. It's not like you your add on to your house you lost you just transferred it from cash to another asset so you don't even really need to pay for that eventually you'll take that money out in a in a mortgage as the house goes up in value so we probably just came to a real number of four million is what you need <laughs> to live well travel around build a basketball court in your house fly private do whatever you want and your your number is just is is four. Yeah. Whereas everyone else is like, oh my God, I got to make a bill. So when you, once you do the math, then it becomes clear like, oh, whenever I feel like stress, oh, I need more, I, I need to start another business or I need to do a, uh, work another hundred hours a week. It's just I could just tell myself, relax. Like you don't need a billion. Like you, you just yeah. make, make the, a rational number that's sane. And uh, then you could do other things that you enjoy. Like you only have one life. You yeah. can listen. Oh, I like I like doing these five things. None of them have anything. To I like playing chess, for instance. Okay, I don't need anybody to do that, but I would love to do that an extra hour a day. Okay, you you start to prioritize the things that are actually important to you that you forgot to do for the past thirty years. And I think that's the biggest thing that I'm hearing you say. It's it's freedom. It's freedom and flexibility to choose yourself uh -huh. but like choose where you want to spend your time you chess me it might be uh working out or maybe go in a stand-up paddle boarding around san diego sure yeah um yeah yeah that like, guitar that we haven't been picking up for a while yeah well maybe business isn't taking up so much time anymore and like look some people love brand business like you look at like richard branson yeah or Morgan, those guys just love business but not everybody loves business right. maybe you love art or paddle boarding or games or spending time with your foster kids. Uh, there's lots of things in life to, to like, but we kind of grew up thinking money, money, money. We got to, yeah. oh, you're, you know, Mr. Rich, you could, uh, you could do all this. Then you just spend your life giving it all away, all the money you work to make. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and again, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with charity, but so Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, between them, they're, they're giving $200 billion to charity. <laughs> That's enough. For, You're doing pretty for, good. <laughs> yeah. like, I'll pretend I'm part of that, and it's like a, a microscopic dot in that. And and anyway, you could do charity in your own ways. Like certainly, when you have taken a foster child, mm -hmm. you've changed someone's life for the better. That's 
you know, just as powerful a charity and, you know, yeah. being a somebody. So, you know, there's lots of ways to have impact on the world other than just spending money. Very true. Yeah. So uh, I love everything you're saying. Oh, and oh, oh, I'm sorry. And I'll, I'll add to that. It's not just about feeling freedom and feeling secure. You kind of have to do the math like I just did, yeah. because yeah. otherwise you'll have an overinflated number that you think you need to get security. So I had an overinflated number that I thought I needed when in fact I was just a huge idiot. <laughs> and I think a lot of people feel like that's just what's necessary, but without that thought pattern that you just went through. And it'd be really interesting for listeners to do the same. Think of their own numbers. I know I'm going to go back and put some real numbers to paper yeah. because it's a freedom just mentally. And then you see what you actually need to live and be happy and give back and all that. And yeah. And you know, and by the way, I, assumed you were going to fly private occasionally. That's a big assumption. I assumed you were going to build a basketball court in your house. That's a big <laughs> assumption. And, and then uh, I kind of assumed, you know, a certain interest rate. And I assumed how much you were going to spend down before you die. You yeah. might want to spend down to zero, in which case you don't need as much. So I, I made a lot of even aggressive assumptions for you guys and yeah. still came yeah. up with a number of quote unquote only 4 million, which I realize is a lot of money still, but it's a lot different than 15 million and it's a lot different than a hundred and it's a lot different than a billion. Sure. And sure. someone who's good at business, sure. They can make a hundred million dollars. If you're really good at business and you spend your life doing it, but it's really stressful. It's, it's, it's for me, it's a really annoying idea to even con contemplate that. <laughs> and if it happens because uh, if you invest in the next Uber by accident, then that's great. But I'm certainly not going to make any effort at all towards making a hundred million dollars. Yeah. So along those same lines, um, I, I know at one point, I think you just got rid of like everything you owned, got rid of your apartment and just kind of, uh, I think your own words kind of went homeless for a while. What, what was the catalyst behind that? Was it a, kind of the same line of thinking of what we're just talking about here? No, I had like um, some stuff going on in my life that was really unpleasant. And at the same time, I had two apartments that I was renting one in New York City, one in the town um, 60 miles north. And both leases were up the same month uh, for various reasons. And I decided, you know what? I hate owning, so I don't want to buy a house. And I hate renting because renting is actually pretty difficult in New York City. You, hmm. you have to get six references. You have to show your bank statements. You have to have a letter from your accountant. They do a background check uh, on and on and on. It's, it's it, to rent in New York city is a full-time job for at least two months. Let me ask like, wow. Was it, how long did it, it's like, it was like two months for you, three months. Wow. It's a full-time job. And, and how many individual pieces of evidence did you have to show? I'm talking to my audio engineer. Uh -huh. How many individual pieces of evidence did you have to show? Six pieces of evidence. And that's Jeez. tiny compared to what I had to show. Cause I had never had a credit card in my life. So, they the land whenever I rented, they were like, "Who is this guy? He has no credit history at all." <laughs> so they 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 it was such an unusual thing in America to have never been in debt, yeah. and so so they wouldn't they wouldn't trust me. So I would have to put I would have to meet them, and I would have to put up a a year rent in advance because they didn't because I had never had debt before. They just didn't trust me to to pay my rent. Mm. It should be the reverse, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, you know, it's always so annoying. So anyway, long story short, yeah. I decided I'm just going to throw, I, I called up a friend of mine and they said, all my belongings are in this one house. I'm not going to renew this lease. And I never want to go back to that house again. I got, I'm going on a trip to California. Just spend a day, take your car, throw everything out for me. I'll pay you. You could, you could either throw things out, give them to charity, sell them or keep them. One of those four things, but don't call me at all during the week that I'm away. And when I get back, I'm, I, I want that lease done. Nothing in that house. It's all clean, spotless. And she said, okay, no problem. It turns out she needed like an 18 wheeler truck and her entire family every single day for a week. And finally the place was, was empty wow. of all my, cause you accumulate a lot of stuff that you don't realize you've accumulated. Yep. This is not free condoing by the way, where you're like, Oh, do I love this book or not love this book? Bring me joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of work. I, I just, and and it's and it's actually too much emphasis that I don't I don't love any object. Uh yeah. like you know, I love my kids and I love the people close to me, but you know, why would I love like 
I don't know. And so she did call me up once during the week. Like, are you sure you want me to throw out your diploma? You worked hard for that. And I'm like, A, no, I didn't. B, <laughs> I have never used that diploma for anything. Just throw it in the fireplace. I suspect actually she kept it just in case I ever want it back, but I <laughs> want it back. But um, then after that, I just, I literally, I, the, the tra- carry on bag that I traveled with to California, that's all I had. So I had like two shirts, two pairs of pants, like the pair of pants I was wearing and the pair of pants in the bag and a computer and a phone wow. and, you know, some, un- you know, underwear. And then I'd go to the Dwayne Reed every couple of weeks as the drugstore that you could buy three t-shirts for $14. So I would, I would do that. Mm-hmm. And, and then I would Airbnb from place to place, or I would stay like if a friend of mine was going out of town, I would just stay at my friend's place. And that's how I lived for, for years. Yeah. You're just keeping it, keeping it easy. And, and yeah, this is super fascinating, man. Just the ebbs and flows. And, and you get to see when you do that, I must've stayed in over a hundred different houses or apartments you get to see how everybody else lives. You know, mm-hmm. some places were not expensive at all. Some places were like dirt cheap. Some were free. Some were more expensive. But I got to see how all the, you know, and I, I didn't really care about having my own. And I built up this, it was this weird kind of discipline. Like I'd pass by a bookstore and I'd see a book in the window like, oh, I really want, like that book. I should go in and buy it. Yeah. But I was like to myself, nope, I can't buy it. It won't fit in my bag. I'll, I'll get the Kindle maybe, you know, the, the, the ebook. Cause I had a Kindle app on my phone and that's it. And then, uh, and then I would also made it a point. I would not leave any footprint of myself in the Airbnbs during the day. So if I stayed in a place, I would leave it as if I had never existed there. So I would take my carry on bag and everything in it and I would leave. And then I would, you know, if I was continuing to stay there, I'd go back it, later, but uh, I always made it a point to, it's like a discipline for some reason of not having any footprint of myself anywhere. Wow. And, it, and, and, you know, so then the New York times wrote an article about this, which I, you know, whatever was a little embarrassing, but then it was weird. Steven Spielberg's office called and, oh, we really want to do a TV show about what you're doing. So I flew out to LA a couple of times, met with them a couple of times, but nothing as these things go, nothing really happened with that. But it was kind of, I had all sorts of interesting experiences doing this. I, I don't do it anymore. I now rent. I was going to ask. <laughs> I was like, is this still a perpetual? Yeah. Um, no, no. I, got, I got married and I'm renting and I have stepkids and mm-hmm. my kids stay with me. And so now it's like a home. That's cool. But, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, just like in the year or so. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was an amazing uh, journey through there. And I know, I know you got a bolt, so I want to be super respectful of your time over there too. Um, let's, let's wrap it up really quick. What are some, we always like to ask, what's a good resource, book, podcast, anything else that you might have that you just find yourself recommending others to be like, Hey, you got to do this. You got to read this thing. It's changed my life. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot because I read a lot of books for my podcast and I've had a lot on, on a lot of fascinating guests. So it's hard to recommend just one, but let, let's say other podcasts, the only other podcast I really occasionally listen to, um, and that I recommend is I think Joe Rogan's got great guests and he's a really good conversationalist and yeah. good interviewer. So I find his podcast fun and interesting and I learn stuff and I'm interested in comedy he's a comedian he has a lot of comedians but he also has on a lot of scientists and yeah and politicians and i just watched the uh joe rogan podcast with andrew yang for instance it was very educational um uh and uh in terms of books uh it's almost like whatever the last book i read was i I (laughs) recommend so i read this book it just came out like last week uh range by david epstein and it's kind of a new approach to the 10,000 hour rule. Like how do you become a master of a skill? So mm-hmm. Anders Ericsson, who sort of developed the notion that it takes 10,000 hours to master any skill. He wrote a book called peak describing more thoroughly the 10,000 hour rule. And also Mal- Malcolm Gladwell's book outliers describes it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and Robert Greene's book mastery uh, describes it. But this book range uh, uh, says, nah, you can maybe, ignore that 10,000 hour rule. If you have a lot of diverse experiences and you kind of look at the intersection of all these, uh, things that you've learned. And that was, 
that was really eye opening for me. It was a really good book. Like uh, you know, other books that I've always recommended: The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. Like, w- as a society, we're kind of programmed to think in the most pessimistic terms. Like, everyone is always saying, "Oh, every- everything's about to collapse. Everything's about to crash." You know, but Matt Ridley sort of shows that historically we always think that way, and we're always wrong as a society. So, and he shows rationally why you should be an optimist. Wow. And you know, and that's sort of, you know, *Sapiens* by Yuval Harari is mm-hmm. interesting. *Sapiens* a good one. Yeah, mm-hmm. human and, human nature and just how we all act. Yeah, yeah, and and I like Matt Ridley's book uh, *The Evolution of Everything*. Um, uh, Robert Greene's book *Mastery*. I mentioned. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's there's really like a ton of books where I say, man, oh oh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life*. Mm-hmm. So all these books are like, oh, I feel like my IQ just <laughs> reading this book. Uh, and there's, it, there's, there's a lot of books like that. If you go down the list of my podcast guests, I've been fortunate to, to talk to almost everybody, all of my heroes and, and they all have books out. Yeah. No, that's, that's fascinating. We're going to link that all up in the show notes, uh, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And everybody needs to check out the James Altucher show too. That's, you know, that's one of my favorite go-to podcasts. I go out and walk my dog every evening and I put on a podcast and it's usually like the James Altucher show, sometimes the Tim Ferriss show and sometimes the Joe Rogan show. Those are kind of my three go-tos. So oh, yeah. Tim, Tim's got a great show too, Tim Ferriss. So I've been on his show. He's been on mine a bunch of times and he's a really good guy. Uh, and he's, he's so, super smart. He's, he, he's a, he's got a great show. Yeah, he does. Very cool. Yeah, I, I think there's. I, I think if if we were allowed, we could probably talk to you for like four more hours. But um, I know uh, we gotta we gotta let you go. Is there anywhere else you want to send people after going after listening to this? What, what's your website? Is it jamesaltucher.com? Is there anywhere else you want to send them? Nah, they can go wherever you know. Just whatever wherever they find me, they find me. So it's okay. I don't like to promote anything, but. Um, uh, yeah, it's been really great talking to you guys. Invite me on again. I'll come on uh, again. It's, we can continue the conversation. Thank you, James. Yeah, no, we'll make that happen. Appreciate your time, man. Have a good oh, one no out there. Thank you guys for inviting me. Thanks. All right. See ya. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. Before taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out, all the good stuff from this episode. We actually have a nice, simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com, find this episode that you just listened to, and uh, give us your email address, and we'll send you the notes. Thanks for listening.